Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you all at this first convening of the semester in the virtual world. First, I hope you and your families are all staying well in these unusually challenging times. And as per tradition, I want to acknowledge that we are grateful to the Quinnipiac, the Wappinger, and the Paguset people as we stand on their land virtually. Keeping in the spirit of recognizing, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Richard and Barbara Frankie for their generosity in establishing the Frankie program in Science and the Humanities at Yale that enables our activities. I'm utterly delighted that uh, they are here this um, evening. I think they are on uh, and they are joining us from Arizona. So um, here's a brief preview of coming attractions for this semester's activities for the Frankie program before we delve into today's treat. So uh, please mark your calendars. We've uh, sent everyone um, uh, save the date. Dan ST will be giving um, a talk on um, October 15th. And then we have Kim Stanley Robinson, um, who will be giving a talk on 18th November. And we have Frank Snowden, uh, who will be talking to us on December 2nd. So um, moving on to today's wonderful event, I'm absolutely delighted to invite you all to our first talk of the season by one of our own, a very distinguished faculty member, Professor Valerie Hansen. Professor Hansen is the Stanley Woodward Professor of History and, re and her research focus has been on China before 1600, Chinese religious and legal history, and the history of the Silk Road. She's the uh, acclaimed author of several books that include um, previous books uh, that include The Silk Road, A New History, The Open Empire, A History of China to 1600, Negotiating Daily Life in Traditional China, uh, Changing Gods in Medieval China, and Voyages in, the world his uh, Voyages in World History. She uh, has written numerous essays, chapters, translated many scholarly books and journals. She is an authority on um, China before 1600, and in particular has really focused beyond China in trying to understand transfer and the history of what we now call globalization, the history of the process and how peoples coming together have uh, impacted each other's ways of thinking and of the view of the world. So during the pandemic, I usually have been waking up to BBC Radio 4. And a couple of months ago, I heard her voice, which I recognized, talking about her fascinating new book and was so utterly delighted when she accepted our invitation to speak uh, at the Frankie program. So she recently published a book called The Year 2000, When Globalization Began, which looks at the impact of travelers who visited unfamiliar locales, the early adventurers and explorers, and who opening up overland and sea routes that mark the true beginning of globalization. So she's going to talk to us. In this book, she has focused on travelers before the so-called age of exploration. So these are really the pioneers who um, in a way joined the world together. She, a brief biography before I cede the floor to her. She joined the Yale faculty as an assistant professor of history in 1988. And the breadth of her intellectual interest is the course titles that she teaches. And I urge you to go and take a look. Um, she uh, has won many, many honors and ha is uh, recognized for her uh, expertise. Her most recent honors include the 2013 Gustav Ranis International Book Prize for the best book on an international subject by a member of the Yale faculty and the 2013 International Convention of Asia Scholars Book Prize Reading Committee accolade for the best teaching tool in the humanities. And I'm sure that this book is going to be gathering accolades. Uh, it has just come out. So um, uh, Valerie, here's, uh, here's to you. Thank you so much for coming once again. Thank, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's 
uh, strange, of course, we're all getting used to Zoom talks. I'm still not used to them. And I hope there are no technical glitches. And if there are, you'll forgive me. I just realized as Priya was giving me such a generous introduction that I don't have a slide showing the book. So I just want to show the book. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so you, it exists. Now, um, I'd like to uh, share my screen. And uh, the talk I'm giving tonight is going to be a traditional PowerPoint, but we'll take more breaks than usual uh, because the uh, I went to the uh, Porvu Center teaching um, instruction over the summer, and one of their uh, pieces of advice was that uh, the students would get bored after about 10 minutes. And I figure you're um, maybe good for more than 10 minutes, but uh, the anyway, there'll be a couple of breaks uh, during the talk and. I wanted to start with something Priya mentioned actually about the main claim of the book and the talk I'm giving tonight about, or this afternoon, uh, about when the age of discovery began and that most people's, and when I say most people, most historians answer would be 1492 and people would talk about Columbus and Da Gama and Magellan. But um, the contention of the book and of the talk tonight is that the Vikings, the Malayo-Polynesians, and the Chinese were also making long distance ocean voyages much earlier, around the year 1000. And the um, reason that this is important is that when the Europeans arrived at different places around the world, um, they found societies that already had sophisticated trading relationships with each other. And um, the level of development in those different places helped the Europeans to penetrate those existing markets much more quickly than if they had arrived um, at places with a blank slate. Uh, and um, I wanted to start, this is a kind of classic that this book um, by Richard Evans in Defense of History, uh, originally from 1997, uh, a manual that's often taught to be first year um, history graduate students and even first year um, undergraduates about uh, that presents a definition of what a historical fact is. And Evans explains that historians use, construct arguments that are based on evidence and the evidence consists of different facts. And so, um, and he says that a historical fact is something that happened in history and can be verified as such through the traces that history has left behind. And historians almost always focus on written sources. Uh, but even the early historians like Herodotus and Polybius uh, and people outside of Europe, uh, like Sima Qian in China, um, traveled to see where the events that occurred that they wrote about to talk to people. Uh, Polybius, is, has a wonderful passage where he goes and he looks at the snow in the Alps when he's trying to figure out how An Hannibal crossed um, the Alps with his elephants. And he looks at the, he goes and visits the Alps to understand the conditions of the snow. And my talk tonight is about the unwritten traces that history has left behind and how historians can use them. And I wanted to start by reminding you where writing was first invented around the world and the places with the red circles, um, everyone agrees that this is the independent invention of writing. So among the Maya uh, in Mexico, modern day Mexico, in Mesopotamia, uh, in China, and then um, the case of Egypt and Harappa in India are debated whether this was independent origin or they were influenced by their neighbors. But you can see that a lot of the world is not covered by these uh, circles. And if we jump to the year 1000, which is what I'm talking about tonight, um, that the, uh, oh, there's a lot of the world that is not, we don't know about that there are no written records from. And that's where um, some new scientific techniques have become very important for telling us about the past. So uh, I'm gonna start with an example. I'm gonna talk about the Americas first, where we have some written um, sources for, uh, that were actually um, oral epics that were recorded in old Icelandic, old Norse, um, and then confirmed by archeology. span And that's where the chemical residues will come in, uh, in terms of American trade patterns. Uh, then I'll talk about the Pacific and the 
um, voyages of the, the Malayo Polynesians. It's a mouthful, but it's just uh, a word for the languages that the, it's the ancestral language of what becomes modern Malay and modern Polynesian. Uh, and then I'll close with the Chinese, which is home territory for me. I am a Chinese historian. And for China, we have a lot of written sources. Um, and so the archeological finds are really a supplement to those written sources. Uh, so um, I begin with the Vikings and these voyages are described in um, the Vinland sagas, which were transmitted orally for several centuries before they were written down in the 13th and 14th centuries. And you can see that the um, Vikings or the Norse travel from Scandinavia uh, to Iceland and from there actually to Greenland. Um, and then from Greenland, they go up, um, this is uh, Baffin Island in the Bay of Baffin, and then uh, travel south and land, and we know this because of archeology, span land on the northern tip of Newfoundland um, at an archeological site called Lansaw Meadows. So what I was gonna say, we know this, but when people first read the sagas, they didn't know where Vinland was. The um, sagas talk about a place that was very fertile and where wild grapes grew. And so most people thought that Vinland was actually farther south than um, Newfoundland. Uh, the, in the middle, the early, the mid 19th century, uh, one scholar proposed that Martha's Vineyard was actually Vinland. But in 1960, um, a, uh, two Norwegians, a, a diplomat and his archeologist wife arrived at um, Lansaw Meadows and they talked to the locals and asked them if there were any places that might be a Norse settlement. And um, the locals brought them to some collapsed grass houses made out of sod and wooden timber. And the locals thought that they were um, the homes of native Canadians, First Nations peoples. But um, the Ingstads uh, began to excavate there. And uh, they found evidence of the Norse that um, I, would, I guess I would say would be persuasive to other archeologists. But then they found this bronze cloak fastening pin. Um, and this was really uh, a, a convincing piece of evidence because it ex matched exactly pins that had been found like that in uh, Iceland and Denmark. And so um, we call it a diagnostic artifact. If you find such an artifact, you, it, it allows you to diagnose that you're in the presence of this X society, in this case, the Norse. And so once the Ingstads did their excavations, there was no question that the Norse had arrived in uh, Northeastern Canada. Um, but there was a question about how far they went. Oh, I was gonna say, this is um, one of their dwellings. It was the biggest dwelling. And um, this is where they found other evidence of the Norse. They found some, uh, like a needle sharpener and a weight used in spinning. Uh, so we, that tells us that women were with them. And um, there was also a boat repair shed where there were um, fragments of iron nails and the peoples of the Americas were working metal around the year 1000, but nobody was working iron. So we know that that was further evidence confirming the Norse presence. Um, then the question is how far south did the Vikings go from Newfoundland? And conventionally, people think that they probably got to somewhere around Maine. There's a, a Viking penny was found um, in Maine. And uh, the evidence now I wanna show you, is this is definitely speculative. This is not um, a, a, a hard clad case, um, but it's an interesting possibility um, that uh, they got as far as the Maya capital here, big city, the biggest city in the Americas, probably about 40,000 people lived there. Um, and it was thriving right around the year 1000. And um, in Chichen Itza, which many of you have, may have visited, this is a famous building that people come and visit because uh, on the equinox, 
this pattern is formed of a sh like the shadow of a dragon's body and then the uh it the shadow uh ends with the head of the dragon so um, that tells you about the sophisticated astronomy um, that the maya had their, their command of um, astronomical knowledge and um at chichen itza was a pool called the sacred cenote and in the pool, the pool was used for various ritual offerings and archeologists have found things from other places that allow us to um, deduce that there was trade between the Maya and other places. And I'll talk about a couple of these examples, but basically if archeologists find something that they know originates from a distant place, they can posit that that was either came to the place it was found either as a gift or a trade item. And turquoise is one of the uh, distinctive things that, distinctive items that archeologists found at Chichen Itza. And the, um, it's now possible to use this um, secondary ion mass spectrometry to identify where um, turquoise has been, an individual piece of turquoise has been mined. That analysis hasn't been done yet on the Mayan materials, but it's been done on materials in um, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. And it turns out that the peoples of Chaco mined their turquoise in a couple of different places. And in Chaco Canyon, which many of you may also have been to, um, there were some pots. These are very typical uh, characteristic pots of um, the Chaco peoples, the ancestral Pueblans. And on the bottom of these pots were some residues. And then when they were analyzed using this high performance liquid chromatography, uh, the scientists doing the analysis, it was funded by Hershey chocolate, uh, found the traces of liquid chocolate. And so that allows us to know that, to conclude that there was a trade between the Maya, um, their center is on the Yucatan Peninsula. They're the only people who are making chocolate in the Americas at this time, and the peoples living in Chaco. Also in the sacred cenote were these gold objects and these have been located as coming from either Panama or Costa Rica on the basis of style. Identical artifacts have been found um, in those two countries. So that tells us that the Maya were trading um, with peoples to the south as well as to the, um, their northwest. Uh, let's go back to that question about the Vikings and whether or not they got to the Yucatan. Peninsula. Um, this is a picture of the Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza. And um, you are not, it's so many people go to the site now that it's no longer possible to go in. But in the 1920s and 30s, there was a team from the Carnegie Institution in, based in Washington that went and recovered some murals. And most of the murals look like this. This is this a scene of um, invaders from one village and the people have been painted in gray, the invaders, uh, capturing the people, the local people, and you can see that the local people have stripes on them. Um, the, uh, so the, those, are, those may be tattooed warrior marks, they may just be a motif that the artist used to distinguish between these two groups of people. I show you this because that's a kind of typical picture, and this, this is unfortunately a watercolor copy of an original mural that has now been destroyed. So all the evidence I'm gonna talk about for the next couple of slides is secondary. It's based, it's, it's I think faithful copies of materials that um, once existed in the 20s and 30s, but were destroyed um, after they had been copied by um, investigators. These are the pictures that are quite intriguing because they show people, these are captives, I'll show you how I know that, but people in this slide, you can see that this um, person has been thrown into the water and he's got blonde hair. He also has beads in his hair. And from other Mayan iconography, we know that that's how the Mayans um, portrayed uh, POWs by putting, um, and this, he's floating there and then this fish is, looks menacingly as if it's about to um, bite his wrist. These murals, none of these murals um, it, it, the totality, they've been, I'm showing you details because the, uh, they're so damaged. Um, here's another 
uh, victim who's got those same be beads um, in his blonde hair. And then here's a victim that uh, we can see more clearly that he's got the um, blonde hair and he also, his arms are bound behind him and he's been thrown into the water. So the question is whether these might have been Vikings. And, the, um, and if they were, how did they get there? And um, a big part of trying to figure out who's moving around the world in the year 1000 and how they moved um, has to do with these gyres, the currents that are in the ocean. And um, so this is a picture of all of the gyres um, in the world's oceans. And then here's a detail of um, the gyre, the North Atlantic gyre. And you can see that um, if, and the red gyre is on the surface of the water, the blue, gy the, blue, um, uh, the blue line is the deep water under the Atlantic. And so if someone, for example, had been blown off course traveling from Greenland to Newfoundland and the sagas report that um, multiple ships were blown off course, um, and had connected with the gyre, um, the gyre could have brought them um, ultimately to the Yucatan Peninsula. And I, I warned you that this is speculative, right? We have no hard evidence um, that they arrived, but it's possible. The ocean currents would have facilitated, or would it, it would have been possible to be um, uh, blown up onshore uh, to the Yucatan Peninsula. And there's one more piece of evidence, which is, um, I think, well, I was gonna say my, our late colleague, Mike Coe, the great Maya expert, he thought this evidence was more compelling than the murals of the POWs, um, that this boat um, you can see is made with planks and they, um, you can see the outline of the planks here. There's nobody shown in the, this picture, this is from a different building at Chichen Itza, um, who is um, a Viking, or a possible Viking. But the, so he, Mike Co um, proposed that uh, this boat was captured from the Vikings and then the Maya used it. And I just give you a, a comparison so that um, you can see a Viking ship. Uh, these are preserved, this is in a museum in Norway. Um, and these have been, these were excavated in the late, uh, 1800s and have been preserved remarkably well. And there's also um, a legend that uh, a Spanish explorer heard in 1588, and you know, we may or may not believe this, but the, when he was going along the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, he met local peoples who told him about um, 70 Moros. So um, he's writing in Spanish and this meaning black people presume, I mean, presumably from Africa. Uh, they called their leader Sheke, which could be derived from sh Sheikh. Um, and then Shekan is the local word for a savanna that doesn't have anyone living on it. So I mentioned that again, just as the possibility that people could be washed up on shore and land on um, the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. Okay, so let's take our first break and uh, see if you have any questions. And oh, I guess everyone is muted. How, how are we, Priya, Priya, help. How are we gonna do this? You can just unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, okay. so Val, uh, Val. Uh, Val. We recommend that people type questions into the chat window and uh, Ty will um, read them out so that all of us can uh, hear the question and we can do it efficiently. Um, so I, I, well, I, I, it's, it's, I can, Ty, would you like to read that out? Oh yeah, sure, that's fine. If you wanna go ahead, um, I'll start with the first one. Is there any ethnobotanical evidence? No, not that I know of. I mean, there's, there's ethnobotanical evidence from Lancel Meadows about um, plants that were excavated there. I mean, there was a very rigorous uh, excavation done over seven years at Lancel Meadows. And so, for example, they found butternuts there and butternuts don't grow locally, but they um, grow farther south. And so um, the archaeologists proposed that the Norse went farther south 
got the butternuts and carried them back to Lansaw Meadows. Um, the site of Chichen Itza has a much more complicated history, excavation, his, excavation um, history. And uh, as far as I know, there's no ethnobotanical evidence. Okay. Have ruins been found anywhere in the Americas? And then we'll get back to the previous question. Um, the, uh, it's funny, there are, um, uh, there are some pseudo runes that have been found, that, um, cop, you know, f uh, fake runes um, that have been found, but uh, there's, no, there's no genuine runes found in North America. Okay, do you see So Eske Willerslev, um, forgive me because I'm probably mispronouncing the name, just published a paper in Nature Today on Viking genomics from four, over 400 skeletons across Europe, Iceland, and Greenland. Are there any bones in the Chichen Itza cenote? Yes, there, there are bones there, but no one has done that kind of analysis on them. And that would be, that would be, uh, that would be a great line of inquiry. And that would be definitive evidence, right, of the type that I have not presented uh, to you. Uh, that we could, if we had, um, they're, they're, the skeletons in the cenote are, uh, don't just, they, they, um, there's, they date over the centuries. But um, yes, if you did DNA analysis on them, um, that, that might give us an answer to, um, to this. And so would finding something like the pin, the bronze pin that I showed you. Are there any references in the North sagas? It seems like the kind of thing the sagas would have recorded if Vikings made it all the way to Mexico. Maybe, you know, that's a, that's a good question about what the sagas would have recorded. And um, I was gonna say one of the historians debate the the use of the sagas. I, for um, many years, I was teaching with Anders Winroth, who's now sadly left Yale and gone to uh, the University of Oslo. And he was consistently skeptical about everything um, in the sagas. So the sagas don't report um, on the Vikings going to uh, anywhere distinctively like the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, Anders was skeptical um, about the descriptions even of their going to um, the, of locating Vinland in North America, except for uh, the site, the site of La at Lansaw Meadows was so convincing um, to him. And I agree with um, the, the comment about it would only be part of the saga if they made it back. And yes, I think the, um, if, if the people I'm showing you were Norse, um, presumably they are painted as um, victims who are being drowned and then they don't survive. Right, they, that's where we're seeing them right before they die. Valerie, if I may ask a question. So haven't gyres evolved? And so were these predictions that were made for the year 1000? No, that's a very good question. And um, I've done, I've looked at diagrams of the currents um, in different periods, but I, I've, my impression is that the gyres are, the basic direction of the gyres is pretty consistent. But I, I, one thing I like about talking to this group is there are people here who know more than I. So if, you know, speak up if you know more than I do, please. Uh, the gyre uh, going, uh, the current going south is actually, is indicated to be uh, deep. Uh, so that couldn't have helped. Would that have helped uh, the, the Vikings go south? I think, well, there, there's a couple of different, the, there's the, yes, the blue line is deep in the ocean, but the red lines, um, sh one of those crosses the Yucatan from, so there's a, 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 a current that cr cr crosses a lot of the Atlantic and then touches down in, um, on the Yucatan Peninsula. But the red line was going north, blue line was going south, right? Do you, <laughs> basically, yes. Uh, uh, I was going to say, let's hold on to that. If there's time at the end, we can go back and look at that slide. Yeah. Uh, Valerie, are you ready to continue? Yes. 
Please go ahead. Okay, um, so now for part two of this talk is about the Pacific. And here, um, almost everything I'm talking about is archeological and there is actually some DNA studies also uh, for, for um, this region and some recent uh, findings from published in the summer. And so um, I'm just starting with a picture of the Pacific Triangle and um, the proposal that um, and this is based on, uh, I think my next slide will, yes, uh, that uh, a, um, an article uh, from PNAS by uh, Janet Wilmshurst uh, proposing two waves of migration. Um, so one uh, to the Society Islands, and then uh, a second wave to these remote islands between, so to these three, the three points on the triangle, to Hawaii and then Rapa Nui, um, to Easter Island or to, and to um, New Zealand. Uh, and this, there's, um, this analysis was done on the basis of uh, careful examination of a lot of carbon-14 samples and uh, consciously uh, looking at smaller like plant lives like leaves and twigs as opposed to charcoal because charcoal can um, live for a long time and um, the contention of Janet Wilmshurst and her collaborators was that uh, the charcoal dates were misleading because they they suggested um, a uh, the settlement of the islands several hundred years before the dates that she proposes. And um, some of the information we have about the settlement of the Pacific is very late from when James Cook, and actually there's some Dutch voyagers uh, who travel in the 1600s, and then um, James Cook in the 1770s. Uh, and th the, these um, paintings and drawings, sketches, give us a sense of the vessels that the Polynesians were using at the time. Um, the poly here, the voyagers are wearing masks. The rowers are wearing masks. This is when they are coming out to meet Cook. And this is some kind of a ritual. That's why they're holding um, this image here. Um, but the pictures show um, two canoes um, connected and then uh, a sail and the um, uh, we know from this information from the uh, 1700s, the 1800s, that uh, the Polynesians could load a lot of uh, possessions, and including animals, onto the framework between the two canoes as they were crossing from one island to another. We don't know what kind of vessel they were using um, in the year 1000. I think many people think that they were using this kind of vessel, but we don't know that there hasn't been any archaeological evidence of the kind of vessels that they used. Um, and then the, uh, some of the information we have about how they did this comes from the late 20th century uh, from uh, indigenous informants. This is a man named Mao Pilag who um, had studied traditional Polynesian sea seafaring as a child. And here he's teaching it um, to his children. Um, and uh, this allowed the Polynesians they basically, they, 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 they did all their navigation without any navigational instruments. This is also true of the Vikings. Um, the Vikings are going shorter distances and they can see, in many cases, they can see where they're going. Uh, the, um, but the Polynesians are orient themselves by looking at the sky, looking at the configuration of the stars. Of course, it varies at, by the time of year. It also varies by your position in the Pacific. And so they memorize these various sets of stars. That's what Mao is teaching here. And that allowed them to orient themselves when they were in the ocean and they um, were not near any land masses. And um, the illustration of this, the power of this system, of this traditional system, was that um, Mao was able to navigate uh, all the way from Hawaii to Tahiti uh, and his um, home, uh, he's from, 
the area around Guam. Um, so he's far from he's far from home. But um, in this voyage, he he does this voyage for the first time, and he navigates a craft all the way from Hawaii to Tahiti um, using um, this set of knowledge that he's learned from um, his elders. And so that I think is, again, we don't know for sure how um, the Polynesians navigated in this period between 1200 and 1290, but it's very suggestive that there's a traditional form of navigation that allows them, that allowed them to cover these kind of distances um, in the late 20th century. I think it's very plausible that they would have used it um, earlier. I was going to say there's a funny story about Mao that he, um, near the uh, end of his life, he uh, is blown off course and he's about two weeks late coming home and his family calls the Coast Guard because they're concerned about him. Coast Guard catches up with him and says basically, can we take you home? And he said, no, 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 I know exactly where I am. I've been in this storm. I've been blown off course, but leave me alone. I'm going to get home. And, and he does. He, he, he shakes them off. So um, the... Uh, the um, DNA report, this was from the summer, um, and this was in Nature, and there's some controversy about it. This is where I hope maybe somebody in the audience can help me. Uh, the, the contribution of the report is that um, the investigators looked not just at Easter Island. People have always thought Easter Island would be the place where there would be the most contact between the, the likeliest site of contact between the Polynesian islands and uh, the west coast of South America. But the, um, these investigators looked also at DNA samples from farther north from the Marquesa Islands. And that's where if you were riding the Humboldt Current along the west coast, going north along the west coast of Latin America, you would um, arrive uh, north of, far north of Easter Island, much closer to the equator. So um, they have a couple of individuals whose DNA shows, um, they say, a specific moment of contact, probably around 1200, which matches nicely with that archaeological study um, I told you about of the carbon-14 dates from the different plants. Uh, and so they propose that. And then, but this I th it would be, I think, more convincing if they had ancient skeletons or pre-1492 skeletons um, that were pre-1492 DNA that allowed them, that showed this. So far, my understanding is that no pre-1492 um, DNA samples have surfaced that show the mixing of the Native Americans with, um, or the Native Latin Americans uh, with uh, the Polynesians. And um, there is some criticism from uh, two uh, other um, investigators who are working on this kind of movement of ancient populations, um, and they're very skeptical about the results. A part of this has to do with um, who was moving and whether the people who were in Latin America had a seafaring tradition or a boat building tradition that would have allowed them to go into um, the Pacific, or whether it's more likely that the Polynesians traveled all the way from the Marquesas or Easter Island to Latin America um, and back. And this also raises the ghost of um, Tor Heyerdahl, uh, who was convinced that um, people had traveled from uh, Latin America to um, the Polynesian islands. Uh, but I was going to say that um, very few people were convinced by um, his, I mean, I think everybody knew about um, Kantiki and his voyages, but very few scholars were convinced that the voyage was possible. I mean, th one of the objections is that when he uh, did this um, reconstruction of the voyage, um, he, he, his raft was towed into, um, off the coast for about 50 miles before he began the trip. And so that's, I was gonna say, the exploration of the Pacific. Uh, there's another set of voyages by, these are the um, speakers, the, so the Malayan languages were re related to Polynesian and the um, modern 
po uh, population of Madagascar speaks the Malagasy language, which is related to Malay. So there's linguistic evidence of a connection between the Malay Peninsula and um, Madagascar. There's also um, cultivation of rice and Southeast Asian crops. And, the, uh, and then here um, you can see this other set of voyages. These took place actually before the year 1000. They start around 500 and um, they go uh, across the Indian Ocean. And um, these have been demonstrated by um, careful analysis of the plants um, in Madagascar versus the plants that are on the African mainland. And the um, plants on Madagascar have produced many more, much more evidence of a rice diet. The um, only places on the African uh, mainland that have comparable finds of rice are sea coast to, of sea or sea ports. And those are presumably where uh, people from Asia, merchants from Asia lived. So um, that, uh, I was going to say, this is a case where really all of the evidence is either archaeological or ethno-historical, is transmitted from, um, you know, is used, the, either the information from James Cook or the information from the late 20th century uh, voyagers or the anthropologists who studied with them to reconstruct uh, the, voy the um, mechanism of the, the, the uh, navigation system, the workings. Ah, now we get to our second break. Let's. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I just wanted to mention uh, the reason that we are muting, having videos muted, is this is a recorded talk and we would otherwise have to procure individual um, uh, release forms from everybody. So thank you for your patience in submitting your questions through the chat. Okay, so uh, someone had asked, how did navigators such as Pau carry enough food and water? And before you answer, we had, uh, Professor Stearns had said that water in gourds as coconuts and gathered from rain falling on their sails is, is I guess a possible answer. Food both packed and caught, their fish in the water all the way, and their fluid can also be uh, drunk much lower salinity than seawater. So about the transport of food and water. Thank you, I was gonna say the only thing I would add to that is that I was um, reading about uh, Tor Heiderdahl today and when um, Kantiki was doing its voyage, the, the fish, flying fish, jumped up and landed on the raft. They didn't even have to fish for them. <laughs> so, so uh, the, um, but uh, yes, I, thank you, um, Steve Stearns for, for uh, that concise answer. Um, and anyone want to help me with the D my DNA question about uh, the the reliability of of um, taking modern or 20th century DNA samples and reading back, proposing a single event occurring in 1200, whether that's um, plausible, plausible or or reliable. Ah, I have stunned, I have stunned my learned audience. Plausible, not terribly reliable. Okay. <laughs> is, is what is a bit offered in the chat. Oh, it's funny, you, you've got more than I do. I don't, oh, I see, I see more from, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, that, that, was, that was my read um, of the evidence. And I think some of this has to do with, what we as historians know about movement along the coasts. And this is one of the objections to that report is that we know for sure the Polynesians are moving all around the Pacific. We don't have evidence of um, the coastal peoples in uh, Colombia and Ecuador uh, sailing up and down the coast of uh, Latin America. We, we don't think, I mean, it's not even sure that they had sailboats. They, they, they probably had rafts, but it would have been very difficult to go up and down. And the, uh, I showed you those pictures from Chichen Itza of the gold items from Costa Rica and Panama. Those could easily have been carried overland. So um, it, there's just not much evidence of a lively, of, of a tradition of ocean travel on that side of, on the western, on the west coast, on the northwest coast of uh, South America. 
So another suggestion in principle, reliable, uh, depends on the contamination from other biological sources. But DNA sequences are quite idiosyncratic with low and calculable mutation rates. So another dimension to, as an answer. That's, that's very helpful. Um, and uh, that's, I, I, um, I need to learn more about that. So thank you very much for that, uh, Henry. And then there's- And new question, yep. Yeah. What about timekeeping? Are there similarities in how these peoples in contact might've kept time? That's a very interesting question. The calendar is very important and calendars move. Good calendars move, right? People are, uh, people in the past really want to know uh, when is the right time to plant crops or when, when eclipses are going to come. It's, I, I write about um, in my book that one of the uh, big questions in um, East Asia, actually 1052 was about people thought the end, Buddhists believed that the end of the world was coming and there were some eclipse predictions and uh, people who could, who could predict um, accurate eclipses or almanacs that had good eclipse data were extremely valuable and people went to great lengths to try um, to import them. Uh, I was going to say also looking at the Q&A that someone asked about um, the anthropology of the Argonauts of the Western Pacific since Malinowski. No, but I will. Thank you for the suggestion. So should we go back to the last part of the talk? It's a uh, I'll go, and it's about China, and it's short, because as I told you, there isn't too much um, science. It's mostly uh, historical records. Um, so I, I just wanted to start with a slide of um, this route, which was the main sea corridor that was in use uh, before 1492 and continued to be used after 1492. And it connected the ports of Southeast China with the um, Persian Gulf ports, especially Basra, which was the closest port um, to Baghdad. And also uh, you can see Oman. And the, um, we, this, there's a lot of Chinese sources um, that describe this route. There's some maps um, of the region. Uh, this is a, I wanted to just explain to you that the reason the Chinese are going there is that they want to import these different aromatics from Southeast Asia. And aromatic is a catch word. You, the Chinese word is xiang, meaning fragrant um, items. And the, these include things like sandalwood. They include spices. Um, like cloves, uh, they, um, there's some natural products. These aren't necessarily aromatics, but like the, the feathers of the kingfisher bird um, were uh, the Chinese valued very much. And when, I mean, I tell you about these things, you can think, oh, well, the Chinese were importing those. They couldn't have been that important, but the society uh, in, in China, and, and we know this from around the year 1000 and then, the use explodes in the next couple of centuries. Uh, people are consumed with trying to change the way that they smell and the way that the air in their houses smell. Uh, and they burn a lot of different kinds of incense and fragrant woods to try to change their um, environment. And the, so those goods are, the Chinese are importing in large quantities and mostly from Southeast Asia, but some of them also come from India and come from uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, the, what the Chinese are selling, uh, they've got ceramics. This is a classic example. <laughs> so this is a slide from my teaching about the iPhone of the year 1000. The thing, the item that everybody had to have was a high fired um, translucent uh, ceramic pot. They were very easy to clean and much easier to clean than um, pots made in other parts of the world that were not fired um, as high. Uh, the Chinese are also exporting metals, uh, ingots, and in, in, so ingots of copper and tin. They're making metal objects like cal cauldrons and woks and mirrors, also some weapons, but we actually don't, the Chinese are using a lot of those weapons within China. We don't have much evidence of their exporting them. Um, and high quality fabrics, both cottons and silks. 
And we have much more archeological evidence about the ceramics than we do about um, the other metals or the textiles. And the main thing that the archeology span tells us that the written records don't is the quantity. So we have descriptions of ships leaving China that are carrying ceramics, but uh, we have archeological sites. One, one ship found um, in Indonesian waters, one shipwreck found in Indonesian waters has 600,000 pots um, were found aboard, on board. It's just a, a quantity that the written sources just give no hint of. And um, this, uh, we also have some shipwrecks, the actual ships that survive. Uh, this one is in a Chinese museum. And uh, it's interesting because uh, it has repair. So you can see the Chinese made this with planking, like the Vikings did, right? I mean, they're different kinds of, it's a different construction, but um, there's, and then the Chinese ships had distinct compartments. My next slide will make that clearer. Ah, uh, no, it won't, sorry. I cut that slide because of time. Uh, the Chinese ships had um, distinct compartments, separate compartments, and those meant that they could, that question we had before about water, they could travel with a compartment that was filled with fresh water. And they also sometimes uh, traveled with a compartment filled with seawater where they had fish um, living in the water that they could kill when they wanted to. But the, the real advantage of those dis, uh, discrete uh, compartments was that if the ship sprang a leak, the, the leak was contained in that one area and not in the whole, it didn't affect the whole ship. Uh, in my talk title, I mentioned LIDAR and um, the contribution of LIDAR to our understanding really of Southeast Asia uh, is that, um, and you can see here that this is the same place, uh, this Top Rome temple in Angkor Wat. And uh, when you visit it, you see all these trees around it and um, it would be, it, it was very difficult for archeologists to know um, whether basically what the terrain looked like, what the surface looked like, because there was so much uh, undergrowth um, in this, this tropical forest. And here is a LIDAR picture that, um, so this is taken by bombarding um, the ground with um, rays and then editing them, filtering them out. And so anything that bounces back from a plant is filtered out. And so that archeologists can see the surface of the land. And the real surprise from Angkor Wat was how many of these, what are now open spaces or forested spaces, historically contained many, many dwellings. And the upshot is that Angkor, Wat, Angkor Wat's population, uh, the estimate has been increased to about 750,000 people, which is far higher than what was previously thought. And there's nothing like, there, there's no information like that in um, any of the written Chinese sources about Cambodia um, at this time. And then the um, last slide of the, about the Chinese is showing you this route that they traveled and the distances that they covered, I mean, in, in some ways, the, I'm going to imply that the farther people went, the, I mean, the more impressive it was. But in fact, cutting directly across here saved uh, quite a lot um, of miles. And that the, this route all the way from Guangzhou um, to Basra and then down to Sofala, south to Sofala, um, this is about three times the length of uh, Columbus's voyages. So, um, I could say just in terms of the distances that were traveled, some of the voyages that take place in, in what we conventionally call the age of exploration uh, were not that much longer. Columbus's voyages were uh, on, a, on a par with those of the Malayo-Polynesians um, and actually shorter than those that the Chinese were traveling um, as they went from and when I say the Chinese, other peoples, Indian, other peoples in the Indian Ocean are also voyaging uh, from the Islamic world and India towards China. Uh, those, um, and so da Gama's voyage, you know, where he circumnavigates Africa, even he is not going farther than the Chinese. Magellan, yes. Magellan goes around his crew. He gets killed, right, in a rebellion in the Philippines. But Magellan um, circumnavigates the world. And so, um, and 
but I was going to say the reason that we pay so much attention to the later voyages is that we know about their impact, that they had an nearly immediate and far-reaching consequences. Um, there were um, many of the people living in the Americas were killed by either the common cold or flu or smallpox. Um, and once America had been emptied of the indigenous, of many of the indigenous peoples, then European settlers and African slaves moved into the new world and there was the creation of the triangle trade. So, I mean, there, that's a huge impact. And the voyages I'm talking about in the year 1000 or around the year 1000, um, the impact is not as immediate, it's not as obvious, but they did affect people who were um, living in different regions. And so the Vikings don't have much impact on North America. They pull out after about 10 years, but they travel east um, into Russia and the Ukraine. This was in the this was discussed in that article in the New York Times yesterday about the DNA. Um, and they um, build the first uh, empires in the Rus Empire uh, is uh, the product of Vikings who have, or Swedes who have come, mostly Swedes, people living in modern Sweden, who have come into modern day Russia and Ukraine and create the Rus state. Um, the, all of the Pacific and Madagascar gets settled by the Polynesian voyages, so that's a very clear impact. And the Chinese economy becomes very heavily intertwined with that of Southeast Asia, uh, so much so, so, so that we have people who had been working the land in China who shift to working full-time in ceramics factories. And we have forest peoples in Southeast Asia who um, you know, traditionally were hunting and gathering, and they start to hunt and, to hunt and gather full time um, to, for specific animals, like those kingfisher birds I told you about that the Chinese want. So, um, and the, the, all of this economic activity from, and these connections that are formed in the year 1000 contribute to the, the um, connecting up of the world in the further connecting up of the world in 1500. Uh, I began by asking or saying I was going to talk about the historian's toolbox and um, I think the toolbox has changed that historians are have to look at DNA and ocean currents and lidar uh, and uh, the residues of the chocolate in ceramic vessels. Do I think historians are going to give up documents? No. I mean, part of it is that we have, as we get closer in time to the present, we have so much more documentary material and, and so much more coverage. Uh, and the documents have the great virtue, all the things I've been talking about, don't really, they, can, they allow us to see some of these changes or to identify some of these changes, but um, they don't allow us uh, to know how anybody felt about anything or how, what the experience was like. And so, the, I think it's very important as we try to understand the history of the whole world and all the different regions of the world that we use every technology we can to reconstruct the past that's lost to us. But, um, but I think there's still pleasures or insights to be, pleasures from studying, insights to be derived from studying these documents, documents that at least so far, these scientific traces uh, and scientific um, testing techniques don't allow us to get at. Thank you very much. Um, standing in as a proxy applause, um, um, I will uh, try to actually um, unmute everybody so that at the end they can uh, give you a round of applause. But uh, I think we can move on to questions now. Uh, so please go ahead and start. Um. Okay. Uh, first one, have you looked at the China porcelain trade to East Africa? Um, a little bit. There's, there's a, very, uh, a very fine scholar who works in that field named Zhao Bing and who's um, French. It, or she's working in, in, um, in France now. And uh, she's... And, and the Chinese have been excavating uh, in East Africa. And so uh, we can see those finds have been um, well published. 
uh, we can see the, the different kinds of pots that uh, were traded that made it all the way to East Africa. And um, the one of the things about Chinese ceramics and our there's a curator at the Yale Art Gallery named um, Denise Leidy, Dr. Denise Leidy, who's an expert in this field, is that when Chinese ceramic scholars look at a piece of a pot or the whole pot, they can tell which kiln it was made, where it was made. And so that's uh, very helpful in terms of reconstructing um, the, the sources of these ceramics and figuring out where they came from in China and then how they traveled all the way to uh, East Africa. The Chinese cartographic tradition. Yes, there is a Chinese cartographic tradition. Uh, the, I mean, as a broad generalization, I'd say that there's more maps of domestic China than there are of uh, countries outside of China, but there are some. And uh, one of the things, the Beinecke has a terrific map of the Chinese coast that um, I've been um, looking at. It's, it's been scanned because of COVID. And so um, I have a color copy of it. And uh, the, uh, uh, should I read out these questions? I'm looking at, these are from Tim Weiskel about- Sure, that'd oh, be great for the recording. He asked about the Chinese porcelain trade to East Africa and the Chinese cartographic tradition. And then Gavin Menges, um, the author of a book called 1421, which I did not mention. Um, I have to say, uh, I don't know any Chinese card carrying Chinese historian who thinks that anything in 1421 is um, believable. So, uh, and he, he claimed that he had pre-Columbian Chinese maps of the Pacific, but in fact, he had post-Columbian maps or, you know, he, he was using later maps and then had mm -hmm. a very convoluted argument about how they, you, you could use these, his argument was these maps from the 1500s were actually based on information that was circulating before 1500. But I, I, any, I think any serious historian would say, no, that information was not available before 1500. Thank you. Our participant would like to know, what about the role of the Indian Ocean currents um, for the, uh, sorry, I just lost it. Do you see it there? Yeah, for Madagascar being populated by the Indonesians. Indonesians, thank you. Um, it's funny, it's, they, they help. And then of course, the real problem is that it's very hard to sail from Africa to Madagascar. That with the ocean currents. It's, so, I mean, that's the real obstacle. I mean, it seems so counterintuitive when you look at a map that the first people to get to Madagascar would have come from the Malay Peninsula and not from Africa. But that is indeed the case. And we know that archeologically because of this evidence of the, from the, of the uh, many, many different plants and many multiple sites uh, where they found the evidence of the rice and other Asian crops on Madagascar, and then a different set of um, more typical African crops on Africa. From one of our new Frankie fellows, when you set out to write this book, did you know that, did you know then that you'd need to expand your toolkit beyond text? And how did your method develop through the course of your research to engage different methods? such as archaeology, LIDAR, et cetera? Uh, thank you for the question. The, uh, I, two of the maps I showed are from a world history textbook that I wrote, co-wrote with uh, my co-authors named Ken Curtis. And when he and I started to write that book, I didn't realize how important these other, um, different, these other methods, these scientific methods would be. Uh, and then as we were working on that book, and it took a long time, uh, I realized that, you know, it was because for world, the world, the mandate of a world history textbook is each part of the world gets its own chapter, <laughs> right? You're not allowed to say, oh, I can't write anything about Southeast Asia because we don't know anything. <laughs> you have to find out what we know. Uh, so that's when I started to um, expand my toolkit beyond texts. And I was always interested in archaeology. I, I, in high school, I was interested in archaeology. And actually, my um, earlier research, I'm interested in uh, excavated texts. So texts that in the ground that archaeologists find, we have such a long transmitted historical record from China, but we have very few texts that um, survive in the condition that they were written in, and then we can look at them today. And those are the things that I still find very compelling. Have and follow. I'm sorry. I was just going to say one more thing about the research method is, uh, you know, Yale is a great 
place in so many ways, but um, I've just found that if I wanted to find out about uh, different kinds of technologies or science um, technologies that I don't know about, that I could go talk to colleagues and they would very generously tell me what to read or, um, or explain things to me when I read what they, when I did my reading and I still didn't understand, they would patiently explain to me. Have you followed the early Dutch cartographic history of South Asia? No, <laughs> but I think it would be interesting, you know, but uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it, I was gonna say one of the interesting things about the post 1492 cartographic history is how quickly the discoveries, the knowledge moves around the world. Mm. Right? The, once people have mapped the, correct, the accurate outlines or even inaccurate outlines, that information is spreading because everybody wants that information. So um, I had a related question, um, Valerie, which is, you know, what do you think, having studied these earlier voyages, what is distinctive about the encounters, you know, the, the colonial encounters that happened later on? Is it just the scale? Is it because, or were, there, were these peoples, when they were moving and trading, did they try to conquer each other already and we just don't know? And I'm just wondering, you know, the colonial impulse, right? Um, seems to have really come to the fore in the, you know, 14, 1500s later on, right? And I was curious whether you wondered, was there something different? As you said, maybe is it because there is information, Europe is then by then, information transmission within Europe is very rapid and uh, things have really shifted in Europe by then or? That's part of the story. I was gonna say one of the things that European historians talk about, which I think is very interesting, is the idea of a colony. There's a, there's a whole bunch of Chinese historians who would say, oh, when the Chinese get someplace new, they don't have this desire to form a colony. And I, that's that can be a very rosy view of the Chinese. And they certainly meddled in local politics and even overthrew princes and replaced them with their own candidates. But they didn't seem to have an idea that you go to someplace new, that's, if it's contiguous with China, then you can add it to China. But if you go to someplace that's not contiguous with China, they seem to just like leave it alone. They would like that, the local ruler to acknowledge the Chinese ruler. The Europeans have this model of a colony and you know, there's Roman colonies, right? We, that goes way back. But there um, has been some very interesting work about the Crusades and the Crusader colonies in the Mediterranean. So that's part of the answer is what's going on in Europe. And when the uh, Columbus gets to Hispaniola, how he, I mean, his first instinct is to claim it for Ferdinand and Isabel, right? He, he's not, where I think the people I'm talking about, they might have landed, but I don't think their first impulse is to claim it for any ruler. Um, and then I think a key factor, uh, and especially significant today, thinking about COVID, is this, um, the role that disease played when the Europeans arrived uh, in the Americas and the catastrophic consequences it had on the local population. Right. So I see a comment on the chat um, where, uh, you know, colonialism is not an artifact of European expansion, but, you know, the Greeks and Phoenicians are also European, incidentally. So <laughs> they're giving me some... And I, and, I, and I mentioned the Romans too, right? I, it's not... Um, yeah. Yes, I agree that colonialism is not an artifact of European ex expansion. I think the interesting question is, where does it come from? Where does it come from and when does it start, right? So because it's a point in time where we can see this kind of notion of um, a colony um, develop and ripen, as it were, right? Right, and I think the Crusades have a lot to do with that. I mean, the Crusader states in the Holy Land, uh, and then when they're... Um, forced to withdraw when uh, Saladin defeats them and they withdraw to Cyprus, right? I th I th that, I, that argument I find very compelling about the idea of colonies going back. I mean, there are earlier precedents, but um, that I think you can draw a continuous line from the Crusader colonies in the Mediterranean to some of the, the um, colonies in the Atlantic, like Madeira uh, or um, the Canary Islands, and then to uh, the Americas. Thank you. I'm looking at the question. We haven't talked about slavery at all. I have a lot about slavery in the book. Um, there's a lot of slavery 
it goes way back in time. I think it probably was the norm um, in almost every society. And yeah. um, I, I, I haven't, I hope I haven't said anything to imply that, uh, that it didn't exist in the past. It, it, it uh, was. Um, right. No, no. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit because you do have quite a lot of it in the book and, you know, um, Wilkerson's new book uh, kind of tries to make the claim that, there's a particular way in which slavery gets configured that um, you know goes back to um, 1619 and the slaves, African slaves coming to America. And I was just curious because in your book you do talk about the fact that the notion of slaves is around for a very long time, right? Um, so would like to know more about um, from you. <clears throat> I, I mean, I think the. I haven't read Wilkerson's book. Uh, the, um, to me, the, what's distinctive about slavery in the Americas after 1600 is the demographic change, that the, the indigenous people have, have been wiped out to such a large extent and that the population is replaced with the African slaves. All of the examples I'm talking about uh, are slaves are... Uh, a source of labor and also uh, in, in many cases, more importantly, a source, a source of children. There, um, there's a, the Cambridge World History of Slavery, volume two, which is about the medieval period, uh, is about to come out and I was lucky enough to see the page proofs. And the, um, in many societies around the world, there are more women slaves than there are male slaves. So that, you know, that, and, and scholars of slavery work on this. Um, my colleague, Ed Reigemer, uh is one of the people that um, they're aware of. There's a lot of variety for how, in how slaves are used um, in different places. Um, I, in the year 1000, any society that doesn't have enough goods to export starts exporting either its people or people it's captured from its neighbors. So it's yeah. just, it's a, the world is short of labor and everybody will pay money for it. So it's a very, appealing commodity a grim grim as this is to us today a participant contributes the question is not one of colonies but one of frontiers a great deal is known uh sorry a great deal is known about trading frontiers i'm just pulling it up here as a source of tension i think uh with trading communities leading to new forms of conquest Well, I go back to what I said. When Columbus lands on Hispaniola, he already has an idea that he wants that territory for Spain. Yes, yes. I mean, so you know, there, there, there's no, there's no prequel to that. His decision, his his desire to somehow claim that land. Mm -hmm. And there's a suggestion of a um, a book that looks very interesting. Um, Commerce and Cartography on Colonial Frontiers, Reexamining American and, and African History Through Maps, which um, I haven't looked at, but I definitely will. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. I'm hooked because it says maps <laughs> there as well. Are there any other questions? Please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, if not, I might chime in and ask one more <laughs> question. So when you showed in the earliest part of your talk about these independent places where languages um, are believed to have originated, um, I say, I know you said um, that, you know, the Harappan language is yet to be deciphered, right? We don't know. And I wonder the fact that we have not been able to decipher it, having deciphered the other ones, can that count as some kind of evidence for independent um, generation? Oh, well, I think it can, uh, I mean, there, there are debates, there is, there's a fascinating discussion about the Harappan script. And um, basically there are, too many elements. I think there are about 400 elements in the Harappan script. So too many for an alphabet, but too few for a pictorial script. Right. <laughs> right. So that's very interesting. Um, you know, is it, uh, I, I hate to say we're never going to decipher it. Right. You know, that, that may be one of those 
problems that somebody figures out. And, and you know, I mean, I was going to say the Maya script defied people okay. for so long. And then, you know, it, uh, this, this kind of basic, I mean, I think there was a coincidence of certain kinds of information that people had discounted. And then other people came along and said, oh, you know what, this is, could be a key piece of information. Some reports from um, Spanish, the Spanish who had contact with the Maya early on and, and saw them writing. And so uh, that information, and then I think also this key idea, which came from, uh, I think, knowing about Japanese, that you can write the same word in like five different ways, right? So a, 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 a decipherer's nightmare that the same word can be written in so many ways. Um, so the, anyway, that's why, you know, I had the Harappan script in a different category. Whether, I what, I, what I found really fascinating to imagine from reading your book and listening to you, to you today was, you know, the imagination of what these encounters, when these people showed up, like how did they even communicate with each other? Like, how would that have looked like? I wonder if you have sort of imagined and speculated and what this might have been like. I mean, I think the Vinland sagas are, that give us the best help on that because they describe uh, people meeting and looking at what each other are carrying, right? And, and, and gesturing to trade. Uh, and then there, there's also that great passage in the Vinland sagas where uh, there's an encounter between um, a woman uh, a, a Norse woman and a, um, a local, an indigenous woman. And the Norse woman says, you know, my name is, I think it's Gudrid. And the uh, local woman says, oh, my name is Gudrid. And you think that makes no sense. And it does, because she's just repeating what she hears, ah. right? So that that would be the logical thing. You just, when you start to work on somebody's language, they say something, you say it back, and then you start building up these sentences. So... Uh, Evidence that women were on these voyages too? Yes, there is. There, and, and there's um, archeological evidence for both the Polynesians and the Vikings. The Viking evidence is we have that um, a needle sharpener and also a weight that was used for, um, uh, as a, uh, to hold the yarn down when you were spinning it. Uh, and we also, in the sagas, they talk about women. There's a, a woman who uh, is uh, quite feisty and she bears, she gets into a fight with the local people and she bears her breast and slaps it with her, a dagger and they all run away, the source tells us, appalled by her uh, behavior or terrified by her behavior. So, and then for the Polynesians, we know women are there because the uh, Polynesians multiply. That, you know, if it had been all men, they would have landed on the islands and died after a certain amount of time, but they, they have children and, and the population gets going. So um, we know that women are on those voyages too. Wow. I think there's another suggestion for another book. Um. <laughs> it's chocolate and Choco Canyon, just a coincidence? <laughs> no, no, it's, not. It's, it's that's trade between, there's sustained trade between um, Chaco Canyon and the Maya. We've got the chocolate going from the Maya north. We also have, I didn't mention this because of time, macaw feathers. So we have these brightly colored uh, green and red feathers and um, we've got feather tapestries that have been found that have these macaw feathers in them that date to around the year 1000. We also have sadly bird cages um, in which there are dead macaw skeletons and the uh, skeletons were uh, malnourished and they had, as if they had been kept inside uh, and not fed enough. So um, there's definitely a two-way trade between Chaco Canyon and um, Chichen Itza. Any other uh -oh. questions? Um, if not, uh, let's thank um, Ravi for a fantastic, thought-provoking talk. And I'll just, uh, I think we should unmute everybody so that we can uh, give her a round of applause.